If you haven't watched part 1, I'd suggest you do so to preempt any questions you might have about the content and scope of the series which have already been addressed, especially as it relates to the first part of this video, The History of Schoener Incorporated. I will not be relying on the 10th Anniversary Ultimania Guide, easy as it would be, because this presupposes that the developers had this detailed history planned out. They didn't. Or, at least if they had, they didn't bother with its inclusion in the original game. What I think the Ultimania timeline represents is an effort to streamline divergent and contradictory information into a coherent whole across the whole breadth of the compilation series, and so is not useful in this analysis. Again, we are relying on what the text says, not what the developers intended. Let's mosey. Part 1. Obscured Origins The origins of Shinra are somewhat obscure within the narrative of the game. The history of when and where they started is muddied. We are told that they began as a weapons manufacturer, but during weapons development research, they discovered that the life stream could be extracted and processed as an energy source, and transitioned primarily into Mako production. That the decision to create an obscure origin founded upon war is appropriate. Capital, that is to say, the bourgeoisie, have their own roots in exploitation and violence. The current place amidst the production cycle, and therefore in society, which capital enjoys, is built upon a mythologized interpretation of history. This version of the past, which serves to reify contemporary socio-economic hierarchies as not only justified, but natural, is served by appealing to the idea of some nebulous bygone era. The distance from the past and from the real origin of wealth serves to dehistoricize analysis and criticism. This is how it has always been. Trying to change the natural order can only result in failure. The most detailed history of Shinra that the player is provided with comes from ex-Shinra employee and everyone's favorite abusive stepdad, Sid Highwind. It's just some really basic dialogue when you are first introduced to his character. He explains that Shinra started out as a weapons manufacturer and that this led to the idea of converting rockets into modes of transportation, even to the point where space travel became feasible. This expanded into the Shinra space program and ultimately led to the abortive launch of Shinra number 26. With the establishment of Shinra's global hegemony at the end of the Meaningless War, they no longer saw the value in space travel and ended the program. All this to say that we have no determined start date for Shinra Manufacturing Incorporated, or whether President Shinra was himself the founder of the company or merely inherited it. Given the relative age of his son, Rufus, as well as the resources necessary to research and expand into Mako extraction, have a science and research development department with the resources to run the Genova project, the soldier program, and all the while simultaneously waging a war for almost a decade, I'm of the view that he inherited his position, but oversaw the expansion into energy production, which would characterize the company as we know it and facilitate its role as hegemon. If we take Shinra to be a stand-in, a metaphor for capitalism, which is kind of the point of this video series, we can begin to see how capital sees itself, as the victor in an ideological war which had spanned decades, but which had emerged victorious with the defeat of its final foe, connected to economic manipulation and military incursion. The victory of capital in the Cold War was, for its proponents, a foregone conclusion. This was the natural state of the world, the inevitable march of human progress, which had finally arrived at the end of history, its promised land. Part 2. Mako. I don't care. I've called it Mako since I first read the word in 1997. I didn't let Final Fantasy VIII change the way I say chocobo. I'm not about to change this. <laughs> 
Anyway, the transition of Shinra from weapons manufacturer to electric company parallels the historic development of late-stage capitalism in the real world. Late-stage capitalism, as defined by Marxist economist Ernst Mandel, is characterized by the shift from what he called monopolistic capitalism, characterized in Japan by Zaibatsu, to globalization, multinational corporations, and economies built around mass consumption. The former capitalist mode focused on international markets through the lens of imperialistic adventure and the oppression and exploitation of colonial territories. Shunya emerged from the war as the single authority, the sole superpower left. Going forward, any resistance to their position would be at the local level, not at a national level, so to speak. Their enemies were no longer organized armies, but small cells of rebel groups, and the occasional monster outbreak. It's worth pointing out that the Shinra military certainly didn't decrease with the coming of peace, but the soldier program expanded even more, and any resistance, even the perception of resistance, was met with the crushing authority of Shinra, of the state. Owing to its nature as a classically formulated JRPG, the existence of differing polities, to say nothing of countries, is nearly absent. You can sort of subsume the various villages and towns into city-states, but even then this falls far short of any meaningful relation to historic city-states. Uh, outside of Wutai, and possibly Cosmo Canyon, the idea that nations exist is difficult to assert. That's okay. It is enough to assert that the position Shinra occupies is at the head of an imbalanced power structure. Shinra reigns over all, and even the last holdouts are barely hanging on. We'll talk about Fort Condor in another video. Returning to the text, Mako reactors operate by extracting Mako from a substance called Lifestream, a subterranean flow of the collective spirit energy of the planet. Through the extraction, compression, and processing of life stream, Mako energy is produced, which in turn generates electricity. Materia, likewise, is created through the condensing of Mako into a crystalline sphere, which can then be used to generate magic. While Mako is plentiful and relatively inexpensive, the process is ultimately unsustainable as there is a finite amount of life stream available. The process, in a very literal way, is killing the planet. Shinra is aware of this, having had one of the current authorities on the study of planet life, uh, Bugenhagen, uh, as an employee at one time, to say nothing of the science and research department. They simply don't care. Their goal is the accumulation of wealth at the expense of everything else. What the development and spread of Mako reactors represent is the ultimate victory for capital. Any other system, any alternative, had been stamped out. However, from a Marxist perspective, late capitalism is also when the contradictions inherent within capitalism would begin to emerge to such degree that successive crises would continually emerge until the system could not hold and, inevitably, give way. Part 3. For Science The purpose of the capitalist mode of production is to extract as much value from workers as possible, while compensating them as little as possible. It is a system which incentivizes, even necessitates, exploitation. In the pursuit of maximizing profits, there are few things that owners will not do within whatever legal framework they find themselves in. The drive to accumulate wealth and dominate markets can lead to some very dark places. There is a small village located at the edge of civilization in the world of Final Fantasy VII, Icicle Inn. Inside this cozy hamlet is a house where the player can view some video and audio recordings of a conversation between Dr. Gast and Elfalna, Aerith's parents. Through the game, we learn that Ilfana was the last surviving ancient, or Setra, uh, prior to the birth of her daughter, anyway. The ancients, we are told, originally settled the planet, but wound up sacrificing many of their numbers early on when they fought against the calamity from the skies, 
the being which Gast would eventually come to name Genova. Gradually, the Cetra became assimilated into wider human culture and society until only Ifalna remained. The Cetra, so legend had it, could communicate with the planet and would one day find the Promised Land, a place of untold spiritual energy. This meant only one thing to the Shinra, Mako. The Shinra had experimented with infusing humans with Mako energy. This was how the soldier program was brought into existence. The Genova project, however, found its genesis in trying to create someone with the abilities of the Cetra through artificial means, by implanting the fetus of a human woman with the cells of Genova, who they originally believed to have been a Cetra instead of the parasitic alien it was. The experimentation with human lives was simply the quickest way of finding the Promised Land, which meant an even more plentiful source of Mako to exploit. When the Genova Project failed to produce the whereabouts of the Promised Land, but rather the greatest soldier to have ever lived, Sephiroth, the project to find the Promised Land was put on the back burner while Shinra used its Mako-enriched and genetically enhanced army to subdue all resistance. Dr. Gast, who had retired to Icicle Inn with Ilfana, and who fathered Aerith, was himself killed by Professor Hojo, who then kidnapped the pair. Both were brought to Shinra Tower in Midgar, where they were experimented upon until Ilfana managed to escape, and while she did manage to get her daughter to relative safety, the effort cost her her life. Aerith herself would grow up under constant surveillance and threat of recapture, eventually giving herself up to save Marlene. Once back in the custody of Shinra, they relaunched the quest for the Promised Land, called the Neo Midgar Project. Shinra would justify its actions as being for the betterment of all, but of course, this would be a lie. If a place like the Promised Land existed, where Mako itself was so plentiful that it didn't even require forcible extraction, then all Shinra would have to do would be to funnel it and let the profits roll in. Shinra would still control access to the resource, despite it being incredibly abundant, and this would maintain, if not increase, their profits, through the mechanism of artificial scarcity. Part 4. Whose Future? During the course of the main narrative, we learn about the hometown of Barrett Wallace, Corel, and how they were all fooled by Shinra. Krell was a poor town which generated its wealth through the mining of coal and was the very last holdout among all of the towns to adopt Mako energy. Proud of their traditions and not wanting to abandon the way of life their forebears fought to protect, there was some initial resistance to the abandonment of coal. With growing financial pressure and few viable markets, Shinra came forward with a plan for a Mako reactor and with the promise of a better tomorrow. Any hope of independence from Shinra would have been tied to their ability to turn a profit, but they had been outmoded, their way of life made obsolete. What kind of future could they offer their children with their only means of earning a living gone? Corel hitched itself to what was now the only game in town. It is worth pointing out that Shinra sought out the supplication of the citizenry of Corel. After all, they would need a labor force to construct a reactor and people to purchase Mako energy. Capitalism is repressive and violent, but relies on the veneer of civility and progress, the promise of working for a living and earning a wage. Ignoring that Shinra was the singular cause of the widespread abandonment of coal, was the architect of their own suffering. The people of Corel gladly accepted what Shinra had to offer. Most of them would not live to regret it. Not far from what is now North Corel, beyond the mountains, past the desert, and across a wide river, nestled in a dense forest, is the village of Gongaga, another small town where the footprint of Shinra is indelible. There had been a Mako reactor built, uh, very close to Gongaga actually. One year after the destruction of Corel, three years before the events of the game, the reactor malfunctioned. The ensuing explosion killed most of the people in the town, 
and what was left was a shell of its former self. No one from the Shinra asked the citizens of Gangaga's permission. They simply saw an opportunity and built their reactor. They appeased them with the same promise of a better world, of a bright and happy future. There are no traces, no hints, of any sort of aid provided to the townsfolk by Shinra. All that is left is a town torn to pieces, both figuratively and literally. This is the great lie at the heart of capitalism, that it, and it alone, can provide prosperity and progress. A path out of poverty for the working poor, an easier life for the middle class, a brighter future for all. The history of capital, the reality of a system which necessitates exploitation for the accumulation of wealth, which uses the promise of happiness to justify suffering, will leave as many Corels and Gungagas in its wake as is necessary to ensure that it retains its place in the hierarchy. When the system fails, when disaster strikes and people are made to suffer, it's not the capitalists who feel it. They are insulated from such things. There are always other reactors, other towns to exploit, other markets to cultivate. When capitalism inevitably fails to bring the prosperity which it promised, the people will at best be abandoned, or even worse, blamed for the failure inherent in the system, and made to suffer for it. Part 5. The Meaningless War The village of Wutai is located to the extreme west of the world of Final Fantasy VII. A lone settlement on its continent, Wutai had existed independently from the rest of the world until they refused to allow Shinra to construct a Mako reactor. It's speculative, but based on the history of how Shinra negotiates with towns, I'm sure there would have been many promises made and guarantees given. Wutai still refused. When trying to cajole the leadership with the economic uncertainty of a life without Mako, they still refused. When negotiations and economic pressure failed to achieve the result Shinra desired, they started a war. The war would consume the planet, drawing in citizens from around the world to fight for Shinra against the people of Utai. The war was not fought out of self-defense or in defense of some smaller polity under the protection of Shinra. The war was not fought in retaliation for some atrocity which was committed by the people of Utai. It was fought because Wu Tai said no. At first blush, this seems like an utter waste of resources and effort on Shinra's part. What is one small, isolated town on the other side of the world compared to the near global hegemony that Shinra maintained? What Wu Tai represented was resistance, a refusal to bow to Shinra's hegemony. An example to the world that life without Mako, without Shinra, was possible. Wutai was not an economically depressed town like Karel, and had access to enough resources and military strength to resist Shinra for years. It took the full force of Shinra, their army, soldier, and Sephiroth to finally bring the war to its end. What had victory cost? Wutai was devastated. Transformed from a town which could stand against Shinra, resist them for years, to a town which relied upon tourists to make ends meet. Tourists, it need be noted, who are now coming from the wealthier parts of the world. Its leadership was demoralized, its population cowed, and its children riven with dread about what sort of future they had to look forward to. On the other hand, the population that had been conscripted into the Shinra war effort fared little better. The manpower and resources required to maintain a conflict far away from any sort of home front of moving troops across continents would have been massive, and surely Shinra wasn't about to shoulder that economic burden alone. The cost in human lives would have been catastrophic, considering the length of the war. Aside from the citizens of Utai who would have died defending their homeland against the Shinra, the conscripted troops would have certainly seen the highest casualty rates. We only learn of one of them by name, because his widow would raise the orphaned Aerith. What material benefit did Shinra see from the war effort? 
what did an almost decade-long conflict actually achieve? The propaganda for one, it was, after all, one of the theaters which saw the deployment of Soldier. Most notably, this is where the legend of Sephiroth began, a towering figure of the battlefield whose heroism would inspire a generation with hopes of their own heroic futures with Shinra. The necessity of the system to recreate itself, to keep it going by inculcating the children of the next generation, was certainly worth the effort. Other than this, and the devastation I mentioned above though, nothing. The original cause of the conflict was that Shinra wanted to construct a Mako reactor, but after the war, they didn't. There is no Mako reactor in Wutai. Why not? This was just the pretense, the ruse, the argument from civilization every imperialist nation makes to justify the invasion of another which it sees as being uncivilized. The war was about dominance, about the finality of securing hegemony over the whole world. It was a show of absolute force, of crushing any trace of a future without Mako, without Shinra. After the conclusion of what Sid called the meaningless war. There would be no mass organized military opposition to defy Shinra. Part 6 The Shape of the World The political landscape of the world of Final Fantasy VII is, as I have mentioned earlier, rather difficult to adequately organize in such a way as to draw direct comparisons to the real world and history. Having to work within the limitations of the game's mechanical separation of settlements as event hubs means that speaking of each separate town as a nation or state is difficult. Even looking at towns like Wutai, one boggles at the sheer smallness of it. As such, certain liberties are expected to be taken by the writers. A suspension of disbelief may be required to support the narrative of the massive, year-spanning war which engulfed the world. Consider the town of Junan, which is effectively a massive artillery battery, housing what was effectively the strongest single weapon Shinra had at its disposal, the Mako Cannon. Powered by the underwater reactor, it is able to fire Mako-infused shells across whole continents. The origin of the cannon is not explicitly discussed in the narrative of the game, but inhabitants of the small fishing village located at its southernmost base state that the current city of Junan had been constructed during the Meaningless War. As such, it stands to reason that the Mako Cannon was constructed to menace Wutai, but there is nothing to show that it was ever actually used to shell the town. Surely, a weapon of this magnitude could have simply wiped Wutai off the map with a few bombardments. Of course it could have, but the destruction of Wutai wasn't the goal of the war. Bringing Wutai to heel and instilling the futility of resistance to Shinra amidst the rest of the world, on the other hand, was. And so the cannon fed into the superiority of Shinra, and the security it represented for those under its control. Places of habitation, villages, towns, and cities are the effective placeholders for individual political entities in the world of Final Fantasy VII. Many towns have mayors, some other titular heads, or council of elders, which represent the only surface-level representation of political organization we encounter. Each of these individuals or groups, in one way or another, through willing participation, negotiation, or coercion, ceded any real political control to Shinra. From the perspective of Shinra, their concern in local politics extends only as far as ensuring an open market for Mako and a cowed population. The day-to-day -day bureaucracy was left to the towns themselves, excepting Junan and, of course, Midgar. In the middle of the metropolis known as Midgar lies Shinra Tower. It dominates everything below it, and nothing rises above it. On the 62nd floor, you will find the Shinra Research Library and the office of the mayor of Midgar, Domino. The mayor, the titular head of the city, is the most transparent of figureheads, and he knows it. He laments that his role has been reduced to that of a librarian when the office he occupies, the titular head of the largest city on the planet, should carry with it the political power that role entails. This does not, however, mean that Domino has the ability to meaningfully change his circumstances. 
nor does he really have the will. Domino wants power, but he is unwilling to sacrifice anything to give up the comfortable and secure life he has to risk his position by opposing the will of his paymaster, of Shinra. Late capitalism, in the real world, operates in very much the same fashion through the ideology of neoliberalism. Any state apparatus or bureaucracy which cannot be gutted or eliminated outright must then be subsumed to the will of the free market, of business. With the globalization of the economy, overt military conflict is disincentivized, replaced with very localized military intervention if all other means of maintaining control fail. The state, without having the kind of wide-scale global conflagrations of the past to fight, will nevertheless maintain and often expand its military capabilities. These expanded military capabilities will all be in the service of maintaining global capital and protecting their interests. The state, the political apparatus which exists as yet another component of the superstructure, will be made to serve and reify the base. Political leaders and the very idea of things like representative democracies become the very means by which a population is conditioned to accept the status quo and the system as it exists, while simultaneously losing any sort of collective power to meaningfully influence the system from within. Any semblance of political power is governed by that which will be in the best interest of capital, not citizenry. Citizens will have a duty to work, to support the system, imperfect as it may be, because they are never presented with any meaningful alternatives. Marx wrote about the worker becoming alienated from the products of his labor. Under neoliberalism, citizens become alienated from the very idea of civic duty and responsibility from their communities, their families, and, eventually, even themselves. Part 7. Contradictions In this video, I have tried to look at the way in which the Shinra Electric Power Company came to its place of global hegemonic power, how its rise in the brief snippets of the history of the world of Final Fantasy VII we are given are reflections of real-world historical developments. One of the recurring ideas is the establishment and maintenance of hegemony and control over the world, and how the defeat of Wutai signified the end to any sort of open resistance to the military power of Shinra. How the lack of an overt enemy necessitated a step back from direct military conflict, and a refocusing on stability and security. Throughout all of this, Shinra had been sowing the seeds of its own destruction. Mako is cheap and plentiful. It's literally moving just underneath the ground. With an extraction process which is far more automated and thus more cost-effective and efficient than that needed to mine and process coal, it can be provided quickly and cheaply to any household which can afford to be connected to the power grid. Even in relatively remote areas, the soft glow of Mako Energy can be a comfort, a link to a wider network of human habitation and the security which comes from being under the watchful eye of Shinra. Mako Energy is also, quite literally, killing the planet. In the world of Final Fantasy VII, the forceful extraction and processing of Mako Energy is diminishing the finite amount of life stream which exists at any one time. Mako extraction, production, and sale is now the primary means by which the Shinra maintains and expands its wealth and its control. The Genova Project the effort to produce an artificial Cetra created Sephiroth, a superhuman soldier who was a definite asset during Shinra's expansionist phase as an aggressive military power. He absolutely contributed to the victory over Wutai and provided a generation of young men and women with a role model to aspire towards. In the process, however, they also freed a parasitic alien life form from its prison and had their greatest soldier turn against them after he suffered a mental breakdown upon learning the grotesque origin of his own birth. The immolation of Nibelheim and slaughter of almost all of its inhabitants during his breakdown, including the murder of the parents of both Tifa Lockhart and Cloud Strife, was just a taste of the devastation Sephiroth would unleash. When the Corel Mako reactor suffered a freak explosion, Shinra blamed the inhabitants of the town, 
with its military hegemony firmly in place and suffering absolutely no resistance to the order it had painstakingly established, their retribution was swift and terrible. Publishing that the accident had been the result of deliberate sabotage, Schoener attacked the town of Corell and then burned it to the ground. Most of the survivors, having no recourse, set about resettling and formed the shanty town of North Corell, embittered but ultimately powerless to do anything. There were two survivors, both of whom had been themselves grievously injured by the Schoener troops, who would not take this atrocity lying down. Barrett Wallace and Dine would both dedicate their lives to revenge and the destruction of Shinra. This is the great weakness inherent in capitalism, a system built on ever-increasing exploitation and a widening gulf of disparity between those who generate and produce and those who control and profit cannot remain stable forever. There will come a point when the contradictions inherent in the system will cause it to collapse in on itself. Eventually, whether through the recurring cycle of economic boom and bust, which occurs based on a model of infinite economic growth that cannot continue, through environmental degradation, or through the development of a class consciousness of the exploited to organize and oppose their capitalist masters. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. A crisis of Shinra's own making was coming. Their decades of greed and consolidation of power of military might and technological innovations would come up against the forces this process unwittingly unleashed. And by the time the dust had settled, the Schoener Electric Power Company would be no more. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment below and I will certainly do my best to answer them. I've also listed the sources for the citations presented in the video if you wanted to look into them as well. If you enjoyed the video, Please like, and if you would like to know when the next part is released, subscribe to the channel. Thanks for your time.